In March 2023, Prodigy Education led a thought leadership session at South by Southwest EDU entitled The Current State of Digital Game-Based Learning. Hello and welcome to South by Southwest EDU. My name is Dr. Josh Pryor and I'm so thrilled to be here with you all. To everyone who's here with us live, thank you for coming. To everyone who's joining us virtually, we're so glad you're here with us today. And I'd like to kick us off with a very short poll how many of you in this room are fans of digital game-based learning? Game-based, get those hands up. Yes. All right, panelists, it looks like we are in good company. Again, we're so excited that you chose to join us today. Let's go ahead and talk a little bit about what we're going to cover during our session. So in the first segment, we're going to talk about the trajectory of the field of digital game-based learning over the last 10 years or so. So much has happened, and the timing of this is just awesome because I think the future is so bright for digital game-based learning, and we're gonna talk about it. From there, we're gonna talk about the implementation of digital game-based learning in the K-12 classroom. There's so many things to think about from professional development to collaboration to standards alignment, and we're gonna dive into all of that. In the last segment, we're gonna talk about the integration of digital game-based learning into the K-12 classroom. Again, there's layers of, for us to consider, thinking about things like accessibility and interoperability and safety and security. So lots to cover today. Let's go ahead and welcome in the panelists. Once again, my name is Dr. Josh Pryor. I'm the Educational Efficacy Director at Prodigy Education. I'm so proud to work there. We're such an innovative group that thinks hard about digital game-based learning and the impact that it can have on students, not only attitudinally, but academically as well. Before I joined Prodigy, I was a classroom teacher and an assistant principal at the school district of Palm Beach County down in Florida. First, I'd like to welcome Dr. Andre Denham. He's joining us from the University of Alabama. Andre, welcome to the panel. Please tell us a bit, a bit about yourself professionally and why game-based learning is important to you. Uh, thanks so much for that, Josh. Um, as Josh said, I'm Andre Denham. I'm an associate professor of instructional technology at the University of Alabama. I'm also a uh, I'm also a hundred percent administration right now. I'm the associate dean for graduate academic affairs in the graduate school. And how I came upon game based learning was as a middle school math teacher bef before I went back uh, to get my PhD, and me trying to find ways to keep my students engaged in the classroom and also as a way to um, help some students that had some deficits in terms of their procedural knowledge and their computational skills. And I came across um, games. So when I decided to pursue my PhD at Arizona State, um, I decided to focus on games in the math classroom. And that's how I uh, got into this great, fantastic world. Awesome, thank you so much for being here. I read some of your research and reached out years ago and, and glad we could finally collaborate. Uh, next, I'd like to welcome Kayla Dornfeld to the panel. Kayla has joined us all the way from North Dakota. She's a highly decorated classroom teacher with lots of experience, and she's also the CEO of her company, Top Dog Teaching. Kayla, thanks for being here. Thank you. I am so excited to not be in cold and snowy North Dakota right now. Uh, loving the temperatures. Um, so I am Kayla Dornfeld. I am right now a full-time third grade teacher. This is actually my 15th year of teaching. Um, which feels like kind of a milestone in some ways. Um, like he said, I um, am a full-time teacher. I am also the CEO of Top Dog Teaching, and I am the 2019 North Dakota Teacher of the Year, and the, uh, thank you, the 2020 USA Teacher of the Year as well. So I, I love being able to work with kids in the classroom and at the same time be able to work with teachers, and kind of having a foot in both doors has been a really um, sort of inspirational season in my life right now. Um, I guess how I came upon game-based learning was way back when um, my school actually went one-to-one -one iPads in uh, Minnesota. And so basically they were like, here's this technology that we spent millions of dollars on and we want you to do something cool. And so I was like, I, I wanna make sure that I'm doing something that's not just making this into like a glorified worksheet, right? Or that it's not just playtime. I wanna make this purposeful and use this technology in the best way that I can. And so that's really um, when I started finding more, more game-based learning um, platforms and apps and things like that. Awesome, thank you, Kayla, and thanks for joining us here. And I'm also very excited to welcome 
Katie Whitehurst to the panel. Katie joins us from Illinois. She is an extremely experienced classroom teacher. This year, she's an interventionist. Katie, welcome. We're so glad to have you here. Tell us about your background. Thanks. Uh, yes, like Josh said, um, I am a teacher from Central Illinois. This year marks my 18th year of teaching, which is crazy to think. That is a high five. <laughs> uh, throughout my career, I've taught um, all grades, kindergarten now up to sixth grade. Uh, and this year, like Josh said, I am a math interventionist for grades four through six. Uh, they are a super fun age to teach, actually. <laughs> um, I got into digital game-based learning um, in my previous district. A lot like Kayla, my district was going one-to-one, -one, and uh, we were provided with a game-based learning that attached to our assessment. And so it was, okay, here are your assessment results. Now let's figure out how to do game-based learning with it. Um, and that just snowballed into using other products, um, especially like Prodigy and, and some other products. Uh, I use it heavily as an intervention teacher now um, because a lot of the students I work with are not as motivated uh, to learn because of their struggles. So it really helps uh, to get their motivation uh, up and get them excited about learning. Awesome. Thank you so much, Katie. And thanks, everybody, again for joining us. Let's hop into our first segment, and we're going to talk about how the field has evolved in the last 10 years or so. So much has happened, and one thing that immediately comes to mind is a survey that was done in 2012 by Blackboard and Project Tomorrow. And what they did was ask teachers, how many of you are using digital game-based learning tools in your classroom at least a few times a month? And in 2012, it was around 3 in 10 teachers. Fast forward by five years, now 2017, they ran the survey again, and it was more than six in 10 teachers using digital game-based learning at least a few times a month. So that number had more than doubled in just a few years, and I think that really speaks to how much it took off during that period of time. So Katie, we'll start with you. You were a classroom teacher at that point in time. What was it like? Did you notice other teachers starting to use digital game-based learning more often? Yeah, so when I started teaching in 2005, you know, there wasn't a lot of game-based learning, um, nor was there a lot of technology being used in the classroom. And uh, so, you know, as schools got to be one-to-one -one and more technology is, is coming into schools, um, the availability of digital game-based learning happened. And um, so a lot of it, in my experience, was word of mouth. Like, hey, I found this new thing. Why don't you give it a try? It's free a lot of the times. Um, and so that, I think, helped to snowball the use of digital learning in the classroom. Um, that combined with uh, students and their motivation to learn and how they're learning in the classroom. Awesome. Thanks, Katie. How about you, Kayla? You had a similar experience, I think. Yeah, very similar. So when, yeah, so when we went to one-to-one -one technology, I was just so excited to have the technology because at that time, I was just thrilled to even have like a smart TV or like a projector in my classroom. I'm seeing so many heads nod. <laughs> yes, like I had to write a grant to get a smart board and I was so excited to get that. Um, and yet then we got these, this, you know, these iPads. And so I knew I wanted to do something good with them. And I knew that the potential was there. I just had to sort of untap it and uncover it. And it was a lot of word of mouth. Um, it was also around then when I started becoming more active on Twitter. And so I'd find like little pockets of hashtags or I would see people who were doing things, right? Um, and I was kind of like on this mission that if something is boring on paper, it's still going to be boring when you put it on an iPad. So like, worksheets are still boring on iPads. And so I really didn't want to do that. I was really looking for something that was going to be more responsive, um, give me some better da data, better feedback. Um, and so that's where I kind of just leaned into more um, game-based learning in a way that kids would be, you know, using iPads in a purposeful way while also giving me the data that I needed while also making sure they were learning and having fun. Sometimes, and in most cases, having so much fun that they didn't even realize they were actually learning, which is like a major teacher hack, I think. <laughs> That's awesome. Thanks, Kayla. Andre, how about for you on the scholarly side? There was a lot of research happening during that period of time. What springs to mind for you? Um, so for me, I'll go back to, um, uh, I would say it's probably like early 2000s is when you start seeing this. First of all, we've been studying games in the educational, uh, for educational use for actually a very long time. 
But in terms of digital game-based learning, I think it, you, I would put its genesis around maybe the early 2000s. There were some things that were happening in the 80s and Malone and Leper, if you look at all those things, but really 2000 when it takes off, right? And so in that, um, with most ed tech things that come up, it's it was uh, touted as what was going to save the world of education, right? So we go through that peak when it's like, ah, we finally figured it out. We have this thing. And then folks are throwing a lot of money at it, uh, folks, a lot of research at it. And then we realize it's not that simple. And then we hit this kind of tr uh, like trough of disillusionment is what they kind of call it. And then now we're at this kind of peak of plateau. And so in that we have, uh, I think if you just want to get a snapshot, there's two great articles, one by Richard Van Eck, and they both have like kind of the same names. It's like digital digital natives, uh, why, the, why the natives are restless. And then he has another one where he follows back up in 2015. And from it, in the 2015 article, he basically says, you know, do games work? And the answer is yes. There have been meta-analysis and uh, tons of studies that have showed that, yes, people learn from playing games. What really we need to focus, focus on is what do they learn best from playing games? Basically, it's not going to solve everything that's that that all the ills of education, but what does it do well? And let's point it in that direction. And then he also um, summarized that there's basically four ways that we've been using games. We've had games that are commercial off the shelf games that we repurpose for educational uh, benefits. We see that, oh, this game can, can teach X or Y. Then we have games that are specifically built for educational uh, purposes. Uh, then he um, moved on into saying, and then now at that time in 2015, gamification is taking is taking place, right? And so that's ramping up. And then finally, the last um, way is, is the one where I think is actually the most promising, but the one that we don't do because it's actually the most challenging is actually have students make games themselves about it. But that's really hard if you're thinking about a traditional classroom environment with all the pressures that that happened there. Um, and then so that's kind of where I would see, you know, re, uh, up to COVID uh, times, time snap in terms of what, where we are in terms of game-based learning on the scholarly side. Awesome. Thank you, Andre. Yeah, we certainly have learned a lot during that period of time. Now we'll fast forward just a little bit to a really unique period in history. We were hit with a pandemic out of nowhere. No one was expecting it. Everybody was sort of scrambling to find resources that would work. I myself had a kindergartner at home that was learning via Zoom, which was really hard to see. And I definitely leaned on digital game-based learning to have him engage with the material that he needed to know, but also have some fun while he had to be on a screen. So that's something that was happening during that time. And at Prodigy Education, like so many other distance learning companies think products that can help, we just saw demand go through the roof for our digital games, which was a really exciting time. But let's hear from the group what it was like during that time. Kayla, you were teaching during that time. We're hit with a pandemic. Yes. What happened? Yes. So I decided, ironically, in my life and in my teaching season that, you know, after 13 years, it would be the right time to switch from second and third grade to teaching kindergarten. So not only did I switch to kindergarten, which is like the wild, wild west, you guys, um, I also was, you know, teaching during the pandemic as well. So it was kind of a double whammy, but in some ways it was a blessing because I didn't know differently, you know. So I think um, it was it was challenging um, for kids for all sorts of reasons. Um, and in my mind, I just kept thinking about how everything that our kids, our students had known in school and their day-to-day -day life was just suddenly gone. And so as a classroom teacher, I really believe the heart of the classroom is relationships. And so I just kept thinking, how can I cultivate these relationships? How can I keep these relationships alive? Whether it was you know, drive by, you know, lessons on their driveway or sitting at their sidewalk or having teddy bear zooms on lunch or um, setting up some kind of, you know, meet on a on an app like Prodigy to have them get together and collaborate and meet and and play and have fun. And so I really looked to things that we're, we were familiar with, which Prodigy is an app that we were familiar with. We had been using it. And so I knew it wasn't going to be something new for my students that was going to be just another trigger or another um, challenge for them. And for those families, these these parents who now also became, you know, full-time counselors and principals and gym teachers and, and all of the pressures that were already being added at home. So I really just brought it back to what can I do that's already familiar and how can I stay true to my focus of, you know, relationships being the first thing and, and the most important thing. 
That's a great point. Thank you so much, Kayla. Katie, how about for you? What was it like during that time? Uh, crazy, to say the <laughs> least. <laughs> uh, in Illinois, we I remember distinctly, uh, we got word on Friday that schools were closing and then we were teaching on Monday. Um, and so I remember my team, we scrambled for 48 hours to be ready to go Monday morning. Um, and we leaned hard into the tech things that students were already familiar with and comfortable with. Um, even now, thinking back, you know, something like Google Slides, we, I thought my students knew how to use that to click in a text box and type. And then they were at home and I was spending countless emails and Zoom calls and on a Google Doc typing live with a student trying to help them. And so being able to lean on digital game-based learning that my students knew how to log on, they knew what to do, it took the load off of me as a teacher a little bit, um, but also on the students, like Kayla was saying, the students and the parents, um, it took that off of them. Um, to engage them, I created my own account and got on and we would meet and we would battle and they would get so excited to see me on there uh, playing with them. And it immediately helped with those relationships that we had worked so hard up until March to foster. Um, and then as, you know, still needing to have uh, evidence of their learning and being able to target my instruction to them, even though we couldn't be together, you know, I was able to get that data right away and see what they needed. I could keep going with our curriculum, even though we didn't have our books at home for the most part and things like that. So um, it was a crazy time, but I definitely would agree that we really, uh, we, we leaned on the things that we knew and we le leaned on the things that were working for us at the time. And then it has snowballed into now it's just a part of our life. So That's great. Thanks for sharing your experience. Andre, what comes to mind for you during the time of remote learning and learning games? Uh, I think for in that in that time period, I think what uh, happened in in terms of not just digital game based learning, but especially in that and other areas, is that um, a lot of things that folks said were impossible, they couldn't say that anymore because you know we were put into a situation where we we had to pivot and pivot fast. Um, and so th I think that was actually great, uh, a great time to, to kind of convert some folks, some remaining folks that weren't necessarily all in on the digital game-based learning bandwagon. So everyone's trying to find resources, right, to, that they can point their students to. And um, what they're coming to find out is that there are actually all these games and, and, and uh, that are out there that their students can actually use to either uh, prep themselves for a lesson that's coming or to work on a skill that they might not be so, so, so sharp at. And so I think that was, that's one of the, the outcomes of the, the pandemic uh, in, terms of, in terms of how we do school that has been uh, something that I think will be long lasting and go beyond just um, that time period. I love that thought, that's a great sentiment. Let's talk about the future of digital game-based learning. There's again, so much happening. And I do think that the future, again, is just so bright for the field. One of the things that I'm most excited about as somebody who works day in, day out on efficacy is the impact that digital games can have on students' thoughts, and opinions as they learn and as they grow. I know as a youngster, I spent so much time in the computer lab and I really enjoyed it. So many digital games and I had a lot of fun and I wish there had been a game that could get me really like hooked on math or hooked on English and really thinking about how excited I could be about those things. So coming back to the efficacy side, I get excited that we have a common language and a common framework under the Every Student Succeeds Act. We understand that there are ESSA tiers of evidence that can be used to have a common language to understand the potential impact that games can have. But curious to hear from all of the panelists what all of you are excited about when it comes to the future of game-based learning. Andre, let's start with you. What are you excited about when it comes to the future? Oh, I think we are, we are, uh, riding the wave that that's that we're at at this point in terms of, I remember I talked about that plateau of productivity and then the fact that we're seeing such uh, su that there are related technological in innovations that are taking place that can then help you know uh, raise the impact of game-based learning is is exciting to me as well um, 
all the rage is is the chat GPT and the, and the AI conversation. But for me, um, I think something that's similarly related is is the 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 insights and the, the new knowledge that we're gaining around learning analytics. Um, games generate, I think actually one of the first articles I ever got published as a grad student was about um, channels of evidence in games. So if you've ever uh, worked on the back end of building a game, you know that there's actually tons of data that it pull, that it that you can actually collect. Anything somebody touches in a game is a data. If they go left, they go right. They go up, they go down. All those things you can you can gather. So back in uh, dating myself, 2008. Sorry, when that article came out, what we were arguing was that a these channels existed, but we were saying it's actually too much data that we can't really make heads or tails of it. Well, now fast forward, I don't think that's necessarily the case anymore. So uh, that's where I, that's one of the things that I'm excited about. I participated in a learning analytics boot camp actually last summer at North Carolina State. Um, for that reason was to just kind of learn more about it and what and it, it kind of convinced me that that's actually probably the, the next wave. So imagine, for example, if you have a, a game that's teaching supposed to be helping a student learn about uh, the quadratic equation, right? What you'd like to know is what you don't want to do is have them stop in the middle of the game and and solve some quadratic equations, right? You want the game actually itself to be the assessment. Well, then you need to be able to collect the right evidence of that and then be able to compare it to, say, some valid and reliable paper-based or computer-based assessment and then say, hey, you get the same results from this. So if I beat level 2A in, in game X, that means I've got the quadratic equation down to some level of competency. I think we're heading towards that in terms of game-based learning. That's something that really excites me in terms of the future. Awesome. I think you're right. I think that's going to be a really exciting piece that can continue, can continue to grow. Kayla, let's get your thoughts. What are you most excited about with the current state of game-based learning and the future of it? I think just um, I've seen the engagement increase over time, which was something that I was nervous about. It was like a burnout of kids, um, you know, interacting with these types of apps or, or devices. And I haven't seen that. In fact, I've seen an overall still increasing, if it's possible, excitement for game-based learning in my classroom. Um, and so I'm excited kind of for that trajectory that we're on, um, but kind of like putting on my teacher hat, I think about um, sort of the why, um, why I'm allowing them this time or why I'm having, you know, like as teachers, we're the gatekeepers for everything that happens in our classroom or doesn't happen in our classroom, right? And so if I'm saying like, this is important to me and this is important to my kids, um, I need to be looking at why we're doing it. Like that why is is just really important. And so one of the really cool things about my why is that now the algorithms are getting so smart with these apps, right? And so smart with these tools. And so if I have um, a, a whole variety of learning levels in my students, um, which I do in third grade, um, it really, with the algorithm changing and evolving, um, allows me to differentiate in my classroom in ways that is just seamless and almost invisible. So it's it's very different um, when you know that you can reach kids at their unique individual level um, using technology compared to like, oh, you're getting this kind of paper worksheet and you're getting this kind of paper worksheet and you're getting this decodable book, right? So it sort of um, masks that, that differentiation piece while also that algorithm is just getting increasingly better at honing in on exactly that skill that my student needs to get to, to master. And so um, getting that data back in real time, the same day, the same hour, um, and being able to use that, you know, with planning, with my interventionists, um, at meetings, um, with parents has just been really powerful. So I feel like it's just getting smarter, while also the engagement level is still increasing. So it's a really, it's a really sweet spot, I would say. Yeah. That's great. Thanks, Kayla. Katie, how about, how about you? What are you excited about? Well, in my role as an interventionist, I think what excites me most is that I'm able to partner with classroom teachers and I can see, uh, you know, the data from all students in my building, not just the students I work with. And that helps me to kind of keep my thumb on needs for students. You know, my job is so flexible and I am, you know, meeting with different kids at different times and exiting them when they've met their, their learning targets and then pulling in other kids 
And so to be able to partner with teachers on a lot of different game-based learning um, applications allows me to, you know, have a good idea of all the students, um, which is essentially a big part of my job. Um, the other thing that I really like, you know, working with students who struggle is that their game doesn't look any different from their peers. And so when they look at a screen over on the other side of the room, theirs looks the same, even though they might be working on content that is one, two, three years below what their peers might be working on, they don't feel different. And um, they feel successful and they feel like they can do it. And I think that helps to engage those learners who do struggle um, and, and allows them to make the gains that we need them to make. Thanks, Katie. Andre, go ahead. I, I just realized I, and it, I, you actually gave me the perfect segue because I realized <laughs> I forgot something that I'm really excited about. We've gotten so much better at designing these games. Uh, I'll be honest, when I started, they were really bad. Uh, we called them chocolate covered broccoli because it, it was it was just, uh, it's Jim G. Jim G, uh, I think is the first person I've ever heard, I heard say that, but it really was that. And it was more like edutainment yeah. than, than anything else, right? So I grew up playing um, Math Blaster, if you remember that, I grew up playing, well, this is actually, a, is actually a very good game. Where in the World is Carmen San Diego? That was yes. actually a well-designed game. Yes. Um, those those type of games. I had a Commodore 64 and a 128. <laughs> um, so besides playing the games, I had to know how to code to even run it. I have to tell my son about that one day. But that's the other thing I'm excited about. And that's a great point, right? So um, as she was sharing with us, you know, the students are in the game, they're in the same game environment, but they don't realize that they're doing different things. It didn't used to be that way, right? And then there's some additional things also mentioned in terms of teacher dashboards so that you can actually see where all your students are and you can track those things. So I think what we learned was, A, we had folks that were great game designers trying to build educational games and they didn't know anything about education so they were building great games but there, weren't, there wasn't any education utility about it. Then we had folks that knew uh, how to, uh, that were great, you know, pedagogians. They know about pedagogy. They were trying to build games, and they built terrible games because they don't know how to build games. They're they're good at teaching. When we got these th these people together in the room, that's when things really took off. And so I'm excited because you can see that's happening now. Even the um, the stuff that goes along with the game. So the game's not released. There's usually now the game. There's also a teacher guide. There's also some recommendations on pacing all those things, and it's tied to standards so the teacher can know all. That's where we've, we've gotten really, really good at. So now that we've kind of honed that in, I'm excited, like I said, to see what the next step is that comes after that. I could feel that excitement, definitely. Yeah, that's awesome. Let's go ahead and shift into our second segment, and this is all about implementing digital game-based learning in the classroom, and there's a lot of layers, a lot of things for us to think about. It's kind of like peeling back an onion almost. Professional development definitely comes straight to mind. Andre, you published an article not all that long ago in a journal called Tech Trends, and it was all about game-based learning, professional de development. What did you learn from that research that can be applied to the things that are happening today? Uh, what I learned is that teachers want to use games. Uh, there's a quote from Becker that I use, but they're not going to use games if they don't have the knowledge, skills, and ability to actually integrate it as part of their practice. And so if you um, heard how my, my fellow panelists kind of stumbled into games, and that's usually what happens. There's, to my knowledge, there's very few, if any, there, there's definitely no widespread integration of game-based learning um, and I'm talking about how to teach with a game, right, in our teacher pre-service programs. Like, those things are jam-packed with all the things that they have to do to get their initial licensure. So there's not any there. There's very few um, um, in-service offerings in terms of um, game-based learning, in terms of learning how to actually integrate it into as a part of your practice. So I created something at University of Alabama called IGBLE, which is the... Uh, uh, Integration. Thriving. Integration. Yeah, you know, integrating game-based <laughs> learning initiative is what it stands for. It's, I, I should know what it is. It's all good. <laughs> right. And so what it was was uh, try to create a way that we could um, set up some formal workshops for teachers where they could learn how to integrate games in the classroom. But what I did was um, I just used the, the literature on what is 
teachers should have in terms of professional development. One, it has to be sustained. So this group met four times a year. They met twice in the fall, twice in the spring. The next is that it has to be integrated in terms of like their day-to-day -day work that they do. So they had to come with something that they were going to work on. So we worked on something at the workshop that they were then going to implement in between that meeting and the next meeting. And then I would go to their school and help them if they needed. I tried to remove all the first and second order, ba order barriers as much as possible. So if they needed iPads, I had a class set of 30 iPads that I purchased. I'd bring the iPads, I'd buy the games. I wanted to reduce all the barriers. The next thing is that it had to be something that was they did in community. So I only had math teachers. I didn't have math, English, social studies. So it was all math teachers around the same grade working on it. And then um, also it has to be something that's coherent to them. It has to make sense to what, teach, what teachers are doing in their day to day. And so by applying those principles, I was able to see some great results. Um, and then the main thing that I took away from it was kind of what I alluded to earlier. Part of it was th the teachers were saying, well, uh, one of the things we taught them was actually how to find good games, because all games are not good games. And it's very important that they understand. I think it's like the first thing we teach them. And so with that, they'd have to go and find games and they'd come back as we, I wanted them to, to say, there aren't a lot of good games out there. So the solution was, all right, so now you're gonna learn to make your own games. So we made them game designers because I live in Alabama, West Alabama, which is, and the area that we covered was from the Black Belt, if you know anything about that, all the way up to Mississippi, which is some of the poorest uh, areas of this country. So they might not even have Wi-Fi, let, let alone a class set of, of Chromebooks or iPads. So, but what they do have is ingenuity and tons of experience as teachers. So we, I took that to leverage to help them make, make them game designers. So I think that that's kind of the next thing in integration is teachers want to use games, teachers are using it. Um, what's, what's happening is that they're finding out about it accidentally. And so they don't, while they have the motivation to it, they might not have, actually have the skills to integrate games so they're not maximizing the benefit of game -based, digital game-based learning. So that's the next thing we've got to work on on the pre-service and the in-service level is providing professional development for teachers around the integration of digital games in the classroom. Such great advice. I love that you really took the research and put it into action and working on following up Igbly with Digbly. So stay tuned for that coming down the road. Katie, what's your reaction to that? What are your thoughts on professional development, making the most of learning how to use tools in the classroom? Oh, I completely agree. Um, it's, it's one thing to stumble upon it. It's another to be taught how to use it and to be taught how to use it efficiently. Um, can I talk to the standards alignment Please a do, bit? sure, absolutely. Um, it's so important to, you know, be aligned to your standards um, and that their, their play is purposeful, uh, that they are working toward meeting those expectations that are set forth. Um, and I love that so many digital games now are aligned to your standards and you can, you know, select your state, select the standards that you're using. Um, and then, you know, as, as an interventionist, I know that this is the standard we're working on right now. So if I want to, I can assign that standard uh, so that I know that my students are, are building their knowledge on that so that we can move forward. Um, and their play is not just play, even though they think it is and they think it's just fun. You know, they're like, wait a minute, you were just teaching me about that. And now it's on my screen. And, and to see them have that light bulb moment is, is pretty great. And that they know that, yeah, I'm having fun, but I'm also learning what I'm supposed to learn. It's so important having the clear alignment of the work that you're doing in class, what you are teaching, and having them see that in the game. And to your point, Andre, it has changed so much. And standards can be so big. We take them and break them down into smaller skills so that the algorithms can really get a sense of how students are progressing. And if they're not progressing well, we can move them back and have them work on prerequisites. So much goes into it. Kayla, what are your thoughts around professional development, standards alignment with games? Right. So I, I think professional development is just so important for teachers and not just like having PD to have PD because we probably all had PD that we just have to have. Um, but I'm talking about like quality PD that's like relevant and purposeful. And here we are literally at South by Southwest. Come on. Like it doesn't really get that much better than this. I don't think it does actually. So um, I think it's important though for you're to have you to have staff buy-in, you know, when you are doing this PD. Um, and it sort of needs to be become like a culture of your school, like that we value this not just as a classroom teacher who is like an outlier who thinks, you know, games are cool, but like 
getting your team to buy in, getting your whole staff to buy in, and also getting your administrators, you know, to understand the importance of it um, and why it matters. Because if we can see amazing learning outcomes through game-based learning, um, that's going to be more engaging, um, more responsive. Think about the responsiveness of a video game compared to filling out some kind of paper, putting it in my tray and getting it back in like, what, five to seven business days, right? Like, it's way more responsive. Um, all of those things matter, right? And so I think having that culture of, you know, learning is fun and learning is important. Um, it, it can't just be like an outlier teacher who's doing it, right? Like, I think it has to be it has to be ingrained in everything that you're doing in your schools and in your classrooms. And so I do think, to Andre's point, we need to go back to our universities. And even though, you know, the pre-service programs are so intense, we know that they also still need to be relevant. And they also still need to be pivoting where they need to be pivoting because education is always changing and our standards are always changing. Um, and so I just think going back to those programs and saying like, hey, I know that this is how we used to do it, but now like, let's, let's look at this because there's actually research that's proving game-based learning works. And so we need to prepare those teachers for that because I, I think that that's a piece that is missing that could do a better job for sure. And I think, Kayla, that's the perfect time to start thinking about collaboration and the pre-service time. And then I think about my time as a classroom teacher, my time as an assistant principal. We worked together to make sure that we were hitting the right standards, but also that we were looking at the data. And as you mentioned, there's just so much information that games can help us uncover, especially for reluctant students. Those were the ones that I found really got into the games. I couldn't get them to do the worksheets, but if we gave them the chance to spend some time having, okay, we're going to have a little fun, you're going to do some learning, then we would get the buy-in from them. And then I was able to get really authentic data and know where the gaps were so I could hit them. What have your experiences all been like in terms of collaborating with teachers or other educators to integrate game-based learning? Kayla, we'll start with you. So I think teachers love learning um, and we want to know more things and we want to do the best for kids always, um, but we sometimes don't know the questions to ask. And so like how we both just stumbled into game-based learning, I definitely didn't know what to ask um, when it came to other teachers. So I will say my number one collaboration secret when I don't know what to do with technology is to ask my students. <laughs> Um, and that is like my best hack, right? Um, when the New York Times visited my classroom um, and they left, they said I was one of the tech savviest teachers in the United States and I like laughed so hard because I definitely am not, but I am definitely good at asking questions and ask your students, ask your students how to play, ask your students um, what the screen looks like, what does this question mark, does this have, you know, text to speech, like what happens when you click this, like get down with them, get on their level and have them teach you. And I think there's a very um, large scoop of humbleness that comes with that and being a teacher that admits like, I don't know everything about this because we don't, we didn't grow up, you know, like here you are being born at the hospital with an iPad. Like that's not my generation. Like that's, that's not what I grew up with. Right. Um, but these kids, like this is all they've ever known. And so I think there is great strength in actually asking, you know, your students to be a little bit more of a leader and have you be a little bit more of a guide. So that would be, I guess, my biggest collab tip when it comes to technology. Awesome. Sure. Katie, what's your reaction to that? I love it. Uh, and I totally agree. Yes. <laughs> uh, anytime I usually have a problem on, you know, on my end or how does this work? The kids are like, wait a minute, let me show you. And then they, you know, they love to tell you how to do it. Um, and then that also kind of leads into how I spoke earlier about me being a participant in it and being a player. They love it when I know what they're talking about and I can say, well, did you see this or have you done this? They're like, wait a minute, you know what I'm talking about. What level are you on? And can I battle you? Like, I'm going to beat you and that kind of thing. Um, even my own daughter, you know, to be able to have a common language with her as well. Um, but on the adult standpoint and the collaboration, um, you know, my job revolves so much around data and being able to, um, you know, track where students are and to be able to immediately collaborate with a coworker on how a student that we share is doing 
um, is is so much easier with digital game based learning because we can both see it. We we can both access that data. Um, we can both tailor assignments or standards to them, um, and so it allows us to just work seamlessly together. And we don't have to take uh, our prep time from one another to be able to do that. We can just log on and take a look and see what the other is doing. And that is so helpful because we all know that we don't have enough time in the day to get everything done, let alone meet with somebody to discuss um, students on a day-to-day -day basis. And so to be able to do that is so extremely helpful. Awesome. Thanks, Katie. Andre, do you have any reactions to this? Um, I'm, I would come from a different uh, lens. That, that, that stuff is, is great. But um, I, for me, in terms of co collaboration, um, I'm going to speak to my higher ed folks in the room, um, especially those that are at uh, R1 institutions or heavy research institutions. Sometimes um, the incentives that we have in order to gain tenure or to pursue grants and all um, leads us to a path where, and this is not a condon, I think it's just kind of the system that we're in. So um, where we might not do research that's messy and we might not do research that's hard and messy and hard research in my space is actually doing research in schools with teachers, with students. It's hard, it's messy. My, my PhD uh, committees was like, what are you doing? You can do this in a lab with undergrads, <laughs> infinitely easier. But my point was it didn't translate. It's not gonna translate, right? I need to actually, as a classroom teacher, I know it's this is all then just theoretical. You actually need to get into that space. So the collaboration I wanna encourage and talk about is more with those that are doing the empirical research on game-based learning and figuring out how, why, when, who, what, and under what conditions game-based learning works to actually work more with school districts and teachers and actually do classroom interventions. It's messy, it's hard. I've, uh, I, can, I can't tell you how many, I've, I literally would have to take a week off to do one study, right? And then my, my power would be reduced because uh, there'd be a fire drill on Monday during the time I'm supposed to be collecting data, or there's a flu outbreak and half the class is there. I can't do random assignment, right? There are all these things that we have to do that doing it in schools make, makes it very difficult, but th those are the, that's the space we need to be doing this research, and that's who we should be collaborating and making sure that we're translating our findings to classroom actual practice. It makes that generalizability claim in some of our research a whole lot better if we do our research in that space. So for the higher ed folks in here, we got to start collaborating more on the ground level with the, with the teachers who have their boots on the ground and trying to really figure out this thing. Because if we do adoption and integration of games in the classroom, we'll take off even more than it is right now. And you can reach Andre on Twitter at Andre R. Denham if you want to collaborate. Um, let's talk about expectation setting. Kayla, I've heard you talk a lot about this, setting expectations as you're using games in the classroom because students need to know that there should be a balance struck between the play that they're doing and what they're learning. So what comes to mind to you in this realm? So I, I always think about sort of the model of how I'm going to roll things out in my classroom, right? Like if it's like, you know, I do, we do, you know, you do, whatever it might be. But I think for me, especially students thrive when they see what the outcome should be. Like when they see that last project, what that should look like or how that should, you know, appear. And so I think having those expectations set of like, here's the end goal. Like when you tell them what the end goal is and you can show them what the finish line looks like, they can figure out how to get there. Right. But they want to see where, where do I end? And so I think setting up those expectations is huge. And so like in my third grade classroom, that might look like having a timer on the board, like we, we have 15 minutes. You only get 15 minutes, right? Like we do timers for everything in North Dakota. I set a timer for how long to get their snowsuits on because we go outside year round. It snows in North Dakota. Just kidding. Not really year round. Just feels like it. Um, <laughs> um, and so we set timers. So like setting a timer, you have this much time. Or like right now it's tournament mode. So you're only going to be in tournament mode or, you know, right now you can only do it as an individual player or you're only doing it as a team player. Right. 
Um, and also I just think about some of my students who haven't had as much um, game-based learning experience because some of those kids haven't come from homes that have a lot of that experience, letting them know, you know, what is the interface? What do the questions look like when it comes up? Um, what kind of, you know, accessibility features are there? Is there text-to-speech? Where can I find that? Um, and then also as a classroom teacher, you know, just happening upon a student who may be working on a problem, I might not know, you know, what they're actually trying to ask on that question. And so I will ask them like, okay, where's the hint, right? Because like there's a hint button usually or like a video that you can watch that will play, you know, what the lesson is supposed to be about. And so letting the kids know all of that before you release them onto a game, I think can be can be really powerful for those kids just because it takes out the, the what ifs and the questions and it really allows them to just kind of have fun with it. So um, I think just setting those expectations is, is really huge, especially for our youngest learners. Great point. Thank you, Kayla. Let's shift into our last segment, and this is all about the integration of digital game-based learning tools into the classroom. There's a lot to think about here. One thing that's top of mind is access, making sure that students have access to the best games in the world that are centered around learning. So Katie, let's start with you here. What are your thoughts on this topic? Oh, gosh, I could go on and on. Um, <laughs> the first half of my career, I taught in a, a high, low-income population um, where, you know, if it wasn't available to be free, most of my stud students wouldn't be able to play. Um, and so to have companies that have the freemium uh, kind of business model is huge. Uh, to break down the barrier of cost for them um, and to have everybody on an even playing field is so important. Um, and from a parent standpoint, to, to be able to support my child's learning and to have them be able to do it without me having to pay, especially if I can't afford it, is so important um, to me as an educator. Um, it, it's nice to know that they can go home and play and it doesn't have to be on a secure network through school. I can go home and I can play it all I want. Um, I actually had a student a couple weeks ago that said, I stayed up till midnight to play last night. I'm like, oh, you need to go to sleep, please. I love that you're playing this game, but please also get some rest. Um, but to have that um, and to take away as many barriers as we can uh, to support our learners is so incredibly important. I love that point. Makes total sense to me. Andre, I've heard you talk about not just software, but hardware as well. What comes to you, what comes to mind for you when you think about access? Yeah, that's a big thing. As I said, I'm in the West Alabama region, which has wild, wildly different um, uh, kind of on the spectrum in terms of what hardware schools have. So um, with that, it, I think, and we're kind of talking about expectations, is managing expectations. Like you, and like I said, I focused on digital and analog games in that you can still leverage what's good about games if even though it's not on the iPad. So letting folks know, yeah, you can still actually do good stuff with it, um, that they're analog games you can either make yourself or you can find um, there as well. Um, also on the software side, I, I will say, that, to add a little bit more, is that one thing I've noticed is that there are a lot of games, as you go up in the grade level, there are actually less games available. And I, my hypothesis is that they're just harder to make. I mean, how would you make a game about, you know, calculus, <laughs> right? You can. There's a, one that exists. It's called like variants. It teaches like differentials. And they've got some good research on that. But it's actually a very tricky game to make well, I should say. You can make a game. But how do you make it well? So we, I think that's something else to manage folks' expe expectations as well is that you're not always going to find a good game. Because remember, all games aren't good games. You're not going to find a good game that lines up directly with the unit that you're teaching right now. That doesn't mean you don't use games and that games don't work. So on the teacher side, I think that's, that's a couple things in terms of um, expectations and kind of managing them when it comes to game-based learning. Excellent points, Andre. Kayla, what do you think about when it comes to access and reducing barriers? I think for me, it's just making sure that the the content, as much as, as possible, is free um, because not only is it not supposed to be up to a teacher to crowdfund resources to be able to provide quality apps in their classroom, which sadly does happen a lot, um, but also to just um, be able to have administrators say like, oh, this is important and this is where we're gonna put some of our funding. This is where we're gonna put some of our money. Um, and so when we look at quality, you know, quality digital game-based um, apps, we need to make sure that 
like you said, all games aren't good games. Like that is something I'm taking home with me, making sure that it has everything that we need for our students and our other classroom teachers and, and making sure that our administrators who ultimately are controlling our budgets see that this is important. So the free, the free accounts are really important to me if they are also quality games. I think that's the key. Great point. And as we shift gears, let's think about privacy and security. It's rightfully a topic that's gotten a lot of attention recently. It's important to me as a parent. And I think about my time in the classroom and as an administrator, making sure we're keeping people safe. I know at Prodigy, we collect just the bare minimum of data to make sure that the product works properly. Kayla, what are your thoughts when it comes to privacy and security as you're evaluating tools? So huge. So um, something that I am really fired up about, which actually I don't think I even talked to you about, is digital citizenship and making sure our students are advocates for their own digital citizenship. Because like I said, like these kids are literally born with Wi-Fi and an iPad attached to them. And so it's so important that our kids... Um, advocate for themselves and understand what is safe and what's not safe. So for me, it starts with making sure that our students are understanding of what digital citizenship is and what it's not and what should a game be asking for and what a game shouldn't be asking for. And so not only um, having students understand what's important and what's safe and not, but also um, our teachers and, and making sure that what's being collected actually needs to be collected. And then not only that, but like what happens with what's being collected? Like that's also something that I think needs to be looked at by somebody before we decide, yeah, we're rolling this out, you know, school-wide. 100%. Katie, how do you evaluate games? Oh, a, a lot like what Kayla's saying. Um, having restrictions on students is so important. Um, as they get into those middle school years, they like to do things that they think are funny uh, with regards to language or, um, you know, chat features. And I appreciate games that allow kids to have choice, but also do it in a safe way. So, for example, you know, choosing your avatar or choosing your name to have it be appropriate uh, where the students aren't just typing in their name. Um, you know, I've done cahoots where they get to type their name and there, can I use a nickname? No, you may not. <laughs> you will type your first name only, please. Uh, but to have that safety measure put in place to protect students, um, to have like fun chat features, but have it where instead of me typing a chat, I'm going to choose a phrase that I want to choose from this list. I still get the choice, but I'm still being safe. Um, that's so important as uh, students are learning how to be good digital citizens, uh, to have Choice, but with boundaries, is so incredibly important. Love that point, Andre. What do you think about in this realm? Uh, I think it's it's a, it's a hot topic, um, especially when we are uh, trying to figure out. As I some of the things I talked about before, in terms of doing the research, you know, learning analytics and all of that. What's the fine balance between what we collect? Um, especially about minors. This is data on minors. You know, how do we make sure it's de-anonymized as much as possible? I think those are some questions that we still need uh, to answer. I think we've got to balance it out because there's some things that we can that we need from the data in order to improve and improve the products that we're providing, but also respecting um, folks' uh, autonomy. That it, it's actually their data, so it may be where we where uh, it might be that you have um, opt-outs that are there um, when students create their accounts that they can say, you know, they, they, they'd they rather opt out, but then it goes back to the citizenship thing to explain what does that mean? Like, why, why are they asking you this question? Which is good, because you should know that. No one's reading the term of conditions. We've all signed away <laughs> our firstborn somehow in one of those things we've clicked that we, haven't re that we haven't read, right? But to understand that students can understand what's happening there, I think that's it. So it's kind of balancing the need to actually have the data, but also, um, making sure people are aware of their rights and providing them means to exercise those rights in terms of what happens with their data. Agreed. And I'm glad that there are organizations out there like I Keep Safe and others that have badges that can help people navigate and get a sense of what companies are doing well and, and feel good about what the products they're using are like. We'll shift into our last topic here, and this is all about interoperability. And know, Andre, when we talked about this panel, you were like, we've got to talk about interoperability, which makes total sense. And thinking about it in the ecosystem of learner, right? You've got the student who's learning. You've got parents 
who deserve to have data and information about their students' progress. And then there's the teacher and the administrator. So many pieces to think about. So Andre, what's on your mind when it comes to interoperability? Yes, it seems we have some questions already, so I will be brief. Um, I would say the main thing is, is on the, the teacher side is making sure that it's plug in, I call it plug and play. That teachers have too, they have too many, too much demands on their time. Mm -hmm. So they need something that they can literally plug and play. Something that lines up well. There's a, le like I mentioned before, there's a lesson plan already. There's all these things that are lined up where it, make, where it makes their ease of entry so much easier. And then in terms, of, in terms of how you then now sell it to your administrators and all of that is that you need to be able to provide them with that there are results. Like this thing is working. This, this, I'm getting uh, the same results as I would get in worksheets, but probably better. Right, you know my, you know if in your school district, if it's the, you know standardized test scores or those measures, those formative assessments you have throughout the year leading up to that, that you're showing your students are doing well on that. That's how that's how it plays. And then also making sure you have the infrastructure in place if you're doing digital games as well within the school. Do we have enough bandwidth? Can we all get on the Wi-Fi at the same time? Like those kind of concerns and working with your district and your school to make sure that hey, you know we we live in this type of world. How we need to have these things in terms. In, in, in order for this type of approach to be successful. Awesome, thank you. Katie, what are your thoughts briefly on interoperability in the ecosystem around learners? I totally agree with everything that Andre said, um, especially the plug and play option, um, because so much is thrown at us um, as teachers, new curriculum, and then I have to implement this and I have to do this assessment. And you know we need things that we can trust we need things that are standards aligned. We need um, activities that are purposeful for our students. We don't have a minute to waste in our school day. Um, and so if I'm going to give something to my students to do, it has to have a purpose. It has to be engaging um, because we've got a lot of ground to make up, especially in a post-COVID world. We, we just don't have a moment to lose. Love it. Thank you so much. Kayla, go ahead. I don't think I have anything else to add that you didn't already say. I think like amen and amen. So <laughs> yeah, I think we're good. Perfect. Okay, then we'll shift into some questions and answers. Uh, please go ahead. Hi, well, thank you first off for this well-structured, insightful uh, session. I work for a nonprofit in the Netherlands and um, we work with K-12 schools on tech and innovation. There's two kinds of pushback I keep hearing when we talk about games in the classroom. And I was wondering if you maybe have some insights from research or uh, experiences in the classroom. First is learning shouldn't always be fun, right? You should learn to do hard stuff that you don't like because it's good for you for your resilience. So that's, that's the first. And the second is um, that being competitive all the time creates some problems around uh, like mental wellness and the pressure to perform all the time. Yeah, they keep getting better, better, better. So I was wondering maybe you guys have Thanks for your question. Who wants to tackle? Well, I'll talk about the not being competitive all the time. I am probably the least competitive person ever. Uh, my students come back from PE fired up about a game. I'm like, who cares? You know, so um, I like that a lot of digital games don't necessarily have to be competitive. Um, so, for example, um, on Prodigy, you can build um, towers in Tower Town. And so it is still answering questions, still getting results for answering things quickly, but I don't have to be in competition with someone else. Um, uh, things like, um, uh, I'd almost compare it to like Animal, Plan or, uh, animal Crossing, um, kind of things like that that allow them to still have fun in a game-based situation, but not necessarily be a competitor. I'll add quick before I turn it over to you for pushback. You looked excited for that one. <laughs> <laughs> and that is everything in moderation. So I think digital game-based learning is incredible, but if it's you know used constantly all the time, like it should be a part of your repertoire. And so if you're using it in moderation, I think you'll have less issues when it comes to competitiveness and elements like that. Yeah, and that's something that was like in the early game, uh, the early days of game-based learning with folks were saying it's the research has shown it's not the case in terms of the competitiveness part of it. And in terms of, you know, learning shouldn't always be fun. Um, what we do know is that engaged learners learn more, right? 
So that's the retort back to that. And games, if you've ever seen someone engaged in a game and hit that flow state, they are very engaged and they are very much so learning something. So that's kind of the counter argument to that. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is China Yu. I'm uh, from Johns Hopkins and uh, I work on an initiative to bring uh, mixed reality experiences for virtual labs. I have two questions uh, about that. Um, the first one is how do you potentially prioritize features between like gaming versus learning, right? Because the teachers want you to develop more of the learning features, but then the students are like, hang on, you, you know, you might want to add more avatars, add me more quests, add more features. So as a you know, product developer or product manager, how do you prioritize between these two? The second one is how do you potentially ad address uh, you know, a lot of the cold star problem in um, you know, this kind of uh, ed tech space? Because while we have a localized solution for Charles Hopkins, right, we're, we're now what we're thinking about is potentially bringing that to additional schools, but then they're like, okay, how do we know that actually works here? But then you have the chicken and the egg problem because if we don't actually try it out in your school, right? How do we actually, you know, even prove that it works, right? And then like we tried previously doing things in the past, such as presenting in conferences, as showing that how Johns Hopkins students like it. We're like, okay, but those are Hopkins students. Right. Those are not, you know, whatever, which, whichever institutions uh, students, right? So I would love to hear your thoughts and your feedback about number one again balancing between game features versus learning features, and at number two, this cold star chicken egg problem. Why don't we start with the second one first? I want to bounce it over to you. You want to go, go ahead. I hit the first one first. That was my dissertation. That's why I hit the first one first. <laughs> so I would go look up some, some things on endogenous game design, and that's when you marry the game mechanic with what you want the student to learn, right? So the game mechanic is how you power a game, and so if you want someone to learn X, they need to do X for the game to work. Because then you don't have to worry about, you know, balancing those two, right? So there's this concept of endogenous and exogenous game design or intrinsic integration of, of the, the, the learning content within the game mechanics. And so what you should do is you're, you should be trying to find metaphors. So if you're, if you're teaching like um, quantity, for example, like uh, base 10, right? They should be doing something where they have to scale, right? The game mechanic should be, in order to be successful, you should be scaling things up, you know, by powers of 10. There should be something around that, and then that's what they do, because that's what you want them to learn. So figure those things out, and you'll be fine on that one. And then the second one, uh, you just got to figure it out. You've got to find a school. <laughs> You've just got to find a school that's going to let you in on that grade level. So use the John Hopkins students to, to, to troubleshoot and work out as much kinks as you can, but you're gonna have to actually find kids that age. Oh, are we out of time? We're oh. out of time, we got the signal. We're, we're gonna stick around in case people have, have the question. uh, additional questions. Happy to chat with you all. We'd love it if you'd keep in touch. Thank you so much for being here Thank with you. us today. Thank, Thank you. you all. Thanks for watching. Keep an eye on our YouTube channel for future thought leadership sessions.